first, first of all, as I sat uh, here uh, yesterday and this morning, um, I was really struck by the passion that people have for trying to advance the science in bringing these novel cell and gene therapies to people who need them. And I, I really appreciate that. And toward that end, what I'd like to spend the next 15 or so minutes doing is telling you a little bit of our passion in trying to help you do that. So um, one of the things we realize needs to happen is we need to have some convergence uh, across the globe uh, so that we can agree on what we're going to consider uh, uh, the terminology for these products. So we have decided that we are going to give a little and that we will join our European colleagues in, in calling uh, some of these products advanced therapy medicinal products. Um, uh, they still can be called regenerative medicine products for those who like them called that, but our, our European colleagues uh, ha have settled on this term that includes gene therapies, including genetically modified cells, uh, cells, tissues, cellular tissue-based products requiring licensure, and xenotransplantation products. One of the things that all of these products have in common is that quality, safety, and efficacy are inextricably linked. I love this because it brings us back to our roots. The uh, Center for Biologics is the successor agency to what was originally the Hygienics Laboratory that was formed by the Biologics Control Act of 1902, at which point, guess what? The quality, safety, at that time they call it potency, but quality, safety, and efficacy of products back then uh, was also inextricably linked. Um, some examples of, it, uh, of advanced therapy medicinal products that are in development include everything from bioengineered skin, blood vessels, uh, simple organs uh, such as bladders, um, to chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And of course, I don't need to tell you, since it's already been mentioned a number of times, that we had a watershed year in 2017 of two approvals of cell-based gene therapies, Kimraya and Yescarta, for hematologic indications. These chimeric antigen receptor T cells really produced responses, uh, clinical responses, in, a, in places where one just simply would not have expected responses. Children who, have had, who had had several lines of therapy for acute lymphoid leukemia uh, and uh, were essentially on death's doorstep and received these therapies and had remarkable response rates um, with now long-term survivors. Um, and the, the similar thing in non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. Um, we also saw in 2017 the approval of Lux Turner, the first uh, directly administered gene therapy for uh, inherited disorder. Um, and that was done with a novel endpoint, which you've already heard about at this meeting. It's been mentioned at least two sessions that I was at, um, uh, the multiluminance mobility uh, test, which was developed by the sponsor in, in, in concert with some input from FDA. And that, again, shows our willingness to start to think about endpoints that really matter for patients uh, that also can demonstrate clinical benefit. Now, with those approvals, we don't want to just stop there. We want to continue to help uh, enable uh, innovative products to come to market. And uh, toward that end, in November of 2017, we put out a suite of regenerative medicine guidances. Um, those were to clarify our existing uh, regulations to make it simpler for people to understand whether they needed pre-market authorization or not for products, as well as to expedite the review uh, and development of innovative regenerative medicine products. Um, the four guidance documents included two uh, final documents and two draft documents. The final documents really were trying to articulate um, what required pre-market authorization and what does not. There was some, still some uncertainty among some about what needs to come into FDA and what does not in the cell and tissue world, and we tried to articulate that in, that guidance, in those two guidances. We also articulated our compliance and enforcement policy. And then there are two draft guidances, and the guidance I'd like to focus uh, a few minutes of uh, speaking about is the expedited programs for regenerative medicine therapies uh, for serious conditions. That includes the regenerative medicine advanced therapy designation, which ARM was instrumental in helping to uh, move across the finish line with uh, Congress um, in 2016. Um, this is a designation, uh, which also has been mentioned on this stage multiple times, which applies to certain therapies, therapeutic tissue engineering products, human cell and tissue products, and combination products, um, as well as genetically modified cell therapies and, uh, and gene therapies that produce durable effects. And, and these products are eligible for a designation that is very similar to breakthrough therapy designation. That is, it's uh, these, all of the expedited uh, programs, uh, such as Fast Track, 
um, priority review, accelerated approval can be brought to bear, and the higher level of interaction with the agency, um, as well as senior management involvement. The, the two extra tweaks um, for uh, RMAT designation are that the level of evidence required to get the designation is, so the bar is slightly lower than for breakthrough therapy designation. One does not need to show that one has clinical evidence that there, it is better than an existing therapy. It just has to have clinical evidence that it could be uh, of benefit. And the other thing is that uh, they're really, I think, very appropriately for these products was an expansion of what can be used um, for confirmatory evidence for uh, products that get accelerated approval. Uh, the data sets can be expanded in terms of numbers of patients enrolled to a given protocol, or people enrolled to a given protocol can be followed for a longer period of time, and, and there, that's only some of the uh, expanded provisions. So we think this is uh, going to be a benefit. Um, it's, the program, I think, has been successful. Has it been successful in terms of uh, numbers? You can be the judge of that since December 14th, 2016. Uh, we've, we've received, uh, as of August 30th, we'd received 74 requests. As of last Friday, September 28th, we'd received 77 requests. And um, the date of this slide, as of the 30th, we'd, he, we'd given 26 designations. As of today, or last Friday, I should say, we'd given uh, a total of uh, uh, 27 designations. So. Um, Many of these are cellular therapy products or cell-based gene therapy products, but some of them are, are, are pure gene therapies. Where is this field going? Well, um, it's going nowhere but up. And we are on the steep end of uh, the growth curve. Um, I think the fact that uh, uh, what I've heard already, the fact that people now see these therapies are reality means venture capital is going to go uh, in, in the direction of something that seems like a more sure bet. And to wit, I think the fact that we had over 100, uh, 100 IND applications in the gene therapy app, uh, area in 2017 is a reflection of that. I can tell you right now that we are well on target to exceed 150 uh, plus uh, investigation new drug applications this year. So we, we are, we're expecting at least at least a 30 to 40 percent, if not 50 to 60 percent increase in the number of investigation new drug applications. It's just to give you an idea of the amount of uh, effort in this field. So what are we trying to do to help move things forward here? We have a suite of gene therapy draft guidances, which we issued. The idea here was to try to address some of the issues that uh, developers are having in the field. There was a great session on hemophilia yesterday. One of the issues in hemophilia, it, hemophilia is a great, I, I, I'm a hematologist oncologist by training. I love hemophilia. I used to run a hemophilia center. Uh, one of the issues there um, is, uh, is that even though we have a wonderful measurement that we can use factor levels, um, there turned out to be some technical issues in people developing products that we really needed to address. So we wanted to be able to address things for diseases like hemophilia, for the retinal uh, gene therapies that were in development, as well as for rare diseases. And so we put out several drafts in the clinical area, as well as several more general uh, manufacturing guidances, one on chemistry manufacturing controls, one on uh, uh, replication competent retroviruses, and another one on the duration of follow-up. We really are trying to take a thoughtful approach, taking into account all of the information we have. And so these are out in draft. Feel free to comment on them. We actually had someone ask me this. We actually really do look at the comments on these. I look at the docket <laughs> routinely, in part because looking at the docket is very entertaining. We get incredibly thoughtful insights in the docket, and we get some incredibly wild, wisecracks as well. <laughs> so it's always entertaining. Um, uh, but all kidding aside, it's open through December 10th, and we'd encourage people to um, to, to give thoughtful comments. We, we do understand that there are other disease entities that people would like us to put forth uh, gene therapy guidance on, and we will take those uh, into account. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's, it's a good time to, to get your feedback. So what are just the last couple minutes I want to use to just talk about some of the challenges in development of advanced therapies. And anybody who's been awake in the past 24 hours around this area probably has heard some of these. Um, but I just have to, I have to uh, essentially bring them home. 
the transition, one of the things that we see is this transition from pilot scale to commercial manufacturing, particularly for cellular therapies, but also sometimes for gene therapies, has been a real challenge. Um, and the traditional pharmaceutical manufacturing paradigm that I grew up with when I was in industry, which is, you know, you have pilot phase manufacturing or first in human manufacturing, and then you have commercial scale manufacturing. And those two groups, sometimes, you know, they just don't meet, and sometimes they even hate each other. But now we are in a place where with some of the products targeted for small populations, they're going to need to move, and they may be able to move because of compelling clinical data from phase one, two studies into the market really quickly. And so I think we're going to need to think about, and, and as people have spoken about, ways of uh, moving away from this traditional paradigm, the traditional paradigm of you know, having two different manufacturing processes, either having scalable manufacturing processes or to have more scripted manufacturing uh, where people understand what will be necessary for the transition from a startup to a, a large pharma or to a larger manufacturing process. The other issue that we have to deal with this, is this issue of clinical development in small populations. And we, we, we understand that that can be a challenge. And so we are very open to novel designs. We've also put forth things like uh, collaborative development programs, this concept that for cellular therapies in particular that have less than super complicated manufacturing. They could be manufactured at different sites potentially enroll patients uh, into clinical trials at each of those sites, and then each of the sites could end up getting a biologics license. This is described in more detail in a New England Journal paper, and you might see documents coming from the FDA in the future about this pathway. Um, uh, so uh, we think it's one that will benefit um, some sponsors at least, and we, we're very open uh, to conversations about how people can use novel designs. It's not necessary to have, you know, I think we can't say it often enough that we don't need, for, for when there's a clear and compelling benefit of something, we don't need randomized data. We don't need placebo-controlled trials. We need, we need to have well-controlled studies that, that show benefit. So um, we're also working uh, to try to improve the manufacture of gene therapies ourselves in a variety of ways. Um, uh, some of that is by collaboration with National Institutes of Health and the National Institute of Standards and Technology and others to facilitate the development of standards, for instance, with the standards coordinating body. Um, we're, and, and internally, what we see as something that we can contribute to help float all boats um, is to help uh, develop cell lines, potentially, and methods which will lead to greater productivity of vectors. Because clearly, um, although some people in the industry have found, found the way forward to making very productive uh, AAV uh, pr production methods and uh, lentiviral production methods, um, it still is a long way to go. Uh, and, and ultimately, uh, a very high yield production methods would potentially bring down cost of goods and make the, the goal of having cures for the thousands of rare diseases really possible. Um, something that we heard from ARM uh, and uh, others uh, was the need to try to simplify agency interactions for gene therapy products. Um, uh, this was actually something uh, that started to be discussed several years ago, and it's finally come uh, to become a reality in August with a, a Federal Register notice that announced this. But right now, people interact with both the National Institutes of Health and FDA and provide essentially somewhat uh, overlapping information uh, to both. Um, given what we now understand about gene therapy, um, the feeling is that the recombinant DNA Advisory Committee can do other things rather than review uh, gene therapy protocols that are now becoming more routine in nature. And what we will do instead um, is review these at FDA. And if there is something that we feel needs to go uh, for uh, advice, we'll send those things for discussion. Um, but more likely, those will be more high-level things and not specific protocol issues. And in addition, this concept that, that adverse events had to be uh, reported to two sister agencies in the same department is, is something we're proposing to eliminate because that was probably uh, uh, just administratively burdensome. 
So finally, I just want to finish up by saying we're, we're constantly looking to try to do things better. One of the things that we clearly see helps people is to have a dialogue with us early on as they uh, move forward to develop products. And one of the things we had we had previously in kind of a nascent form called the pre-pre-IND meeting, which nobody could figure out. We've now branded as an interact meeting. And these are essentially non-binding early meetings where you can come in and tell us about, basically the idea is not to come in with a long regulatory document, it's to come in with essentially a short document that says what your product is, where you're trying to take that product, and what you'd like to know from the agency. And we'll have a non-binding discussion about that so that we can help guide you and so that we, you know, we can provide you with some information so that you don't either overdo it or underdo it uh, for what's necessary for IND uh, enabling work. Um, uh, because we see it go both ways. Some, some sponsors do more than they need to uh, to uh, get to an IND. So we really want to work collaboratively here and we hope people will take advantage of this. There's a website here. We just posted um, the uh, the, the standard operating procedure which describes uh, the kind of documents we'd like to see. So we hope people will take advantage of that. And with that, I just want to thank you all so much for everything you do because we're here obviously to make sure that products that are safe and effective make it to market. But we want to help do whatever we can to help you who are actually making those products uh, be able to get them there um, uh, in a timely manner to people because otherwise uh, we're, we're not going to make the progress we'd like to see in a timely manner. So thank you.